went upstairs early and tried to finish my presentation. <laughs> okay, uh, we're here to have a bit of a more advanced session on scalable vector graphics. I'll rush through some of the very basics. My name is Marco Dings. I'm co-founder and technical director at the Virga Group, uh, together with Ruth Cheesley, who happens to be in the room. I'm a technology enthusiast and perfectionist, and I love good things in life. And I recently got appointed to BLT, so good thing to contribute. Why do we use scalable vector graphics? Well, you want to use them because they're scalable, as the name implies but they scale to just about any size without loss of resolution. So if you have one file, you can use it on either a big Mac screen where it renders perfectly, or you could render the same thing on your smartwatch and not have loss of resolution, all with the same file. Uh, it's, it renders pixel perfect, so also the high resolution Mac Retina displays anything because the rendering of the graphics is done in the browser. And that makes it a really nice thing to watch. A very important thing, and also part of the dragons that we'll be encountering, is the fact that we control it, can control it through CSS. So, contrary to your typical icons, which you have an image and you can't change any attribute of that image. With CSS, you can add, uh, change parts like color, uh, positioning, and even animate it, but we'll get to parts of that. Animating uh, will bring your icons to life. Don't overdo it, but it's a very nice feature on interaction. So how do we use scalable vector graphics? I'm not going uh, into depth into that, but you can use them as an image. Just declare an image tag, image, blah, 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 SVG, and you'll have a basic representation of that SVG in your web page. Now, that's very basic. You can also, and you can't manipulate any of the content of that because that image is loaded into a shadow DOM, and you can't control that. If you embed it, then you take the actual code of the SVG and put it, like type it into your web page. That makes it so that it is available in your DOM, document object model, but it kind of defeats the purpose in the sense that everywhere where you need to use the same SVG, you'd have to copy in the same amount of text, and it's a pain in the proverbial butt uh, to do versioning and well, keep your content up to date. That's why I prefer what I call injection. That's where we use some form of JavaScript, where we inject that SVG, that externally referenced SVG file into your DOM so that you can do stuff with it. Change parts of colors. So as an image, you would have something like image class, SVG, and then reference the source, that will be it. If you inject it into the, if you use JavaScript to inject it, you would have like an image declaration, some kind of special class name, which allows your uh, JavaScript to identify that this is actually an SVG, and then you have your external reference, and it will get injected, and you can manipulate it to your house as well, to a large extent. If we're looking at libraries to do that, the one that I prefer uh, just to inject it into the core is called uh, one that's free, that's used by Use Iconic. You can find it on GitHub. And here you'll see, I, is this readable from the back? Then you have to move in front, Crystal. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it says, uh, my SVGs to inject, 
uh, query selector also image, and here's a selector image dot inject me. If you remember from the last page, it said, had a class name inject me on it. And this will pick up on all the images that have this class and treat them as scalable vector graphics and actually insert them into your DOM. Nice thing about this is also that you have a fallback. So for the browsers that don't support all of your features, you can define normal images that uh, replace your vector graphics. So you don't have the full experience, but still uh, you can have uh, at least something to show for. This is in the bird's eye view. Uh, you can read up on this if you go to veragroup.com slash etv. There's all of this more extensively as I covered that in previous talks. And that's where I'll be adding uh, the stuff of this presentation. <coughs> now, here we dragons. If you use SVGs very basically, then you're kind of okay. You have the option with a fallback uh, for Internet Explorer. Predominantly eight. And we see a green line just across the board for the uh, most important browsers. Uh, this is uh, from a website, Can I Use It? I think I would guess probably most of you know that. And uh, well, seems like you're okay. What can go wrong? Well, unfortunately, quite a lot. Because if you start to look further, then you'll see, well, lots of stuff are, is indeed covered by anything up until, uh, uh, up from Internet Explorer 9. So SVG filters where you can do Photoshop-like stuff, blurring, etc. You have the inline SVG, that's what I called embedding, that's supported. You have fragments identifiers. We'll come back to that later in much more detail, but there you can address parts of your SVG to hide them, color them, do stuff with them. So that's covered across the board. Oops, uh, wrong way. Um, the usage of SVG in CSS backgrounds. So you can use your SVG as a normal image and put it in your background. That's fairly covered fairly okay. Some of the mo mobile browsers, like Opera Mini, Mini, don't do that that well. Uh, well, what I described earlier, the using of SVG in image elements, that's also used, uh, uh, done quite good across the board. Safari doesn't do it uh, because it doesn't support base uh, encoded images. Uh, but yeah, that's, it's a minor detail if you use normal SVG, uh, which is plain text, then that's just fine. Uh, SVG effects. Uh, that's why you do transformation filtering using CSS, as you know from your normal uh, uh, HTML. It uh, uh, starts to be a bit uh, worse. Opera Mini signs off on this entirely. But still, these can be used without thinking. Now we're getting to the unsafe ones. And that's what where Internet Explorer signs out. Uh, just about uh, after Internet Explorer 9, and we I only list 11 here, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work in Internet Explorer. Uh, Explorer and that's a real pity, because that's a, uh, we have to work around that in many ways. Uh, and yeah, it's just not fun. So the first one to note, uh, we'll come back to that as much of that is SMIL, it's animation. SVG actually has a built-in language to animate elements, to trigger transitions or trigger uh, and chain uh, animations uh, from one element to another. And it's a really powerful thing, but it's not supported in Internet Explorer. Clipping paths. 
So where you can like use an arbitrary SVG shape to lay over an image and cut out a circle or the form of a heart or anything that you can draw an SVG. Again, sorry, Internet Explorer doesn't support that. Uh, some advanced filtering. Again, uh, blurring, grayscaling, brightness, hue, and contrast. The more advanced, like Photoshop kind of uh, filters. Sorry, Internet Explorer, no game. Blending elements. So, so Internet Explorer, no game. But here it starts. Other browsers start kicking in. So we are getting into really uncharted territory. If you want to use those elements, uh, yeah, be aware of what your audience is. If you can't provide a fallback, same as embedded fonts or five, five icons. Well, the only one that supports that is Internet uh, is Firefox. Uh, if you want to have an SVG in your fav icon, so. I'd say SVGs is fun, but it's not plug and play. And some brain power is required. And hence, that's the dragons. And we're going to cover parts of those. SVGs. The first part uh, to wrap your head around is the way. You're squinting, Ruth. Can't you see it? Oh, yeah. It's a bit bright. That's So it says Canvas, Viewport, and SVG. The first thing to wrap your head around is how does an SVG actually display? Because it is very powerful. If you just do an image and don't worry about anything, that's OK. But you can do really powerful things if you wrap your head around the concepts of the Canvas and the Viewport. So my idea was to depict the ball with a canvas. That should be this, which in principle is infinite. You can draw as much to the right and the left as you want. And it has its own coordinate system. You define a viewport on that. So that's a window through which you look at that canvas, the window. That window has a coordinate system. Now, that's a bit, that's the first thing to wrap your head around. Well, that the X, the horizontal direction, goes from left to right. That's, well, kind of a giveaway. But the Y goes from top down. So that's something to realize. In normal mathematics, you'd expect it to go up. So we define the width and the height. The width we look at it, and the height that we look at the canvas. So the infinity symbol that we see here, only the part up until here, we see. That's the first part. You can cut out that. And that's how it displays on your web page. So that's the space it occupies in your browser. Next is the view box. That's a really powerful concept once you wrap your head around that one. The view box has a minimal x, a minimal y, a width, and a height. It kind of defines the coordinate system within the viewport. The width and the height drop or extend the canvas behind it. You could uh, almost see it as if the distance of the window to the canvas is varied. So if you look through a window, if you go, if I now look through the, out this window, I see some part of the reality outside. If I move closer, I can see more what's to the sides. If I move back, that at one point I'll just see, well, only the stuff right ahead. That's what your view box does for you. Now, I can only move perpendicular to the window, but in the view box, I could also tilt it so that the top half uh, gives me a wider view or uh, a narrower view, and the bottom half, if that's further away, will give me a 
Now, you know, the top half that's further away will give me a wider view, and the, uh, you know, the, top, the bottom half that's further away gives you a wider view, and the top half that's close to me will give me a narrower view. So it's cropped or extended, and then scaled to fill the window. Now, don't worry, we'll get to more examples because this is, it took me quite some while to wrap my head around it. Then we can also move the origin of the window to the left or the right so that I can choose which part of the canvas to actually look at. This coordinate system is, uh, is applied after the transformation. <clears throat> it's as if you move your window frame with respect to the canvas. Whom did I not lose at this moment in time? <laughs> well, you're very brave. I've got some examples. Um, this is a uh, local hack of a, a really nice tool uh, provided by Sarah Sweden. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I'll have a link later on. And this will allow you to play with these coordinates. Because of Joomla, I decided to add on a Joomla logo to the parrot to give it some local uh, flair. So, bear with me. We have a view box, a uh, viewport that has a coordinate system that starts at 0, 0, and then it's 800 pixels wide and 600 pixels high. So, here we have 800 pixels, here we have 600 pixels. If I now say I have a view box, that's exactly half the size in height and in width, then this will be the result that you see. You could look at it if I cut it out here, 400, 300. So that's the cropping that would occur. And then that square piece of canvas is stretched in equal directions to fit this canvas. Now, in this example, it has the same aspect ratio. So the width uh, regarding to the height is both the same in the view box and in the view port. So, uh, yeah, there's no real surprises because it actually completely fits. Oop. Sorry. Same example, but we add an origin transformation. So we say we move the X by minus 100 pixels and the Y by 50 pixels. Now, mind you, we're not moving the canvas. Yes, Frank. Um, isn't the first number the width? No, in the view box, it's the origin. So X, oh, in this, well, you'd spell it out, but in this tag place, so there's this X, Y, width, height for the view box. Okay, because I thought uh, I would just have it out from the... No, well, you write it out, you'll write X is and Y is and width is, but for the sake of uh, writing it down a bit more condensed, this is it. Now, mind you, you're not moving uh, the canvas, you're moving the frame. So by moving the frame that you look at, minus 100 pixels to the left, it has the effect of moving your parrot to the right. Make sense? Yeah, there'll be a quiz afterwards, and those failing will be uh, rewarded. Yeah. No, it's the same. It should be the same one. Oh, yeah. I, I just focus on the origin part, sorry, uh, to, to have that. Because that's what happens. It's in sequence. Uh, uh. So first, it gets cropped out. And to illustrate the part of the moving of the origin, I departed from this picture instead of the other one. 
so you see, by using these two, you can look at all parts of your canvas and zoom and do stuff. Really powerful. Now, what happens if you use a different aspect ratio? Because then your cutout, if you stretch it, it won't fit your viewport. Because if it's not the same aspect ratio, either the width of your cutout or the height will not fit. They can't fit both ways. This is a more elaborate screenshot. If you use that uh, tool by Sarah, you can enter the uh, minimum X, minimum Y, the width, the height. And below here, you have a box called preserve aspect ratio. And there you can set the alignment. Now there's a whole lot of options you can set. It's set to X middle and Y middle. So it actually centers, takes the center of the picture, uh, of the cutout. So you could uh, also set it to uh, the minimum or the maximum. We'll have some examples. And there's this box that says meet or slice. Meeting uh, will uh, say that you stretch it and you stop as soon as one of the, either the horizontal, uh, the horizontal width or the height, when stretching it meets a border. So, in this example, 800 times 600 and 400 times 200, we see that the X width is actually half. For the Y, the height to be half, it would be 300, but no, it's, it's 200. So we see here the width of, of the height of 200. So when stretching it, we get for the width to hit the borders first, and because it's set to meet, then it stops. Now we come to the part where it's not actually cropping because you will get uh, the view of the top half and anything outside of that window after you've rescaled it. But that makes it much nicer. So because of the middle one, the room that's left over vertically, it's now used in the, it's centered in the middle. So we have uh, the, the, the 100 pixels that we have extra here are distributed on the top and on the bottom part. Any questions, please, if I'm going too fast. It took me quite a long time and I will be really proud if you get all of this after the session, but have no illusion, have no shame. You'll Yes. Yeah. Well, it's it, well. There's more fancy word to it. It's called art direction of your SVGs, where you can manipulate stuff. So you could zoom in or pan over your uh, canvas uh, if you want to. But the basic use would be sprites and zoom and pan. But I'll have some examples of those later on. Um, well, we've been enlarging it, but we can also make the thing smaller. So we duplicate the horizontal space in my view box. So that's two times the width and it's two times the height. Uh, and uh, even and stick to my 200, then we see that we have much more space left here, much more space left there. It's still centered because this is the crop out. This will be then the center of that crop out. And it still, in this case, aligns to the longest edge because the, when I scale up the X, uh, when I scale these numbers up, the 800 will hit the maximum value first. Now, if you do the same thing and compare meat to slice, remember meat is when, when you scale up, and the first width or height that hits the borders, then the transformation stops. If you do slice, you zoom it up, and then the last one to hit the borders uh, makes it stop. So in a view box of 800 times 600, this is the initial one. So we have this, and it just gets positioned in there. This is with the transformation. 
the same minus whatever transformation. And if you slice it, then you get this part because it gets stretched, not with uh, the 800 matching first, but with the 600 matching first. You can also warp your stuff when you say, okay, uh, the alignment's now set to none. Then it doesn't care. It, it just treats the view box as being a piece of elastic and it just warps it until it fits uh, the window you're looking at. But it can have its use cases. Uh, so it, it meets all edges until it fits. So if we want to have a, let's see if that works, really. That's with all the preparation. Yeah. So here we actually have that parrot. I just made a local copy. Uh, not out of disrespect to Sarah, but to be sure that I could show you this uh, here locally. So if you want to try it out, be sure to visit her page on that. So you can actually manipulate your width and see what's happening with the coordinate systems. So here you now see it fits 730 pixels, 1200, so it's still meeting the horizontal first. If I add in height, then you'll see it will grow. But I can also slice it. And then, yeah, you see it'll start to crop out stuff. I, um, that's probably not going to work from here. So I have to go there. So 100 moves to the left, minus moves to the right, 200. So if you want to wrap your head around this, play with this. And then things will become more clear if you keep the explanations in mind. Or at least they should become more clear, I hope. In Sarah's explanation on this parrot, there's actually some errors, so still have to report them because they on, I know, only noticed them in preparation of this talk. So be sure to visit sarahsoeden.com demos interactive SVG coordinate system. She has a number of very good presentations and talks on SVG as she's really active. So she's a really valuable person to all of this. Uh, next topic of conversation, presentation attributes. Uh, well, it's best to compare them like uh, styling attributes in, uh, you know, from CSS, like border width, uh, what have you not. In SVGs, there's some additional ones and some that are called differently. So you have fill, which is, well, the color you fill something with. The stroke, yeah. SVGs, a scalable vector graph, it's all about drawing stuff. So you draw lines. And the stroke width, the width of the line, that's controlled with this one. An important thing to know is that when you draw something in SVG, it initially, it always draws it in SVG1 as if it has uh, no width at all. So if you add on a stroke afterwards, it just centers around that. So that can take you aback if you're not aware of that. Color visibility, stroke width. Uh, stroke is then, you can dash, dot, dash, uh, do all kinds of stuff with that. Now, there's a huge list. I don't even try and be uh, complete in here. Uh, but that's why we have the interwebs. So w3.org uh, has a list with all of the properties that you can 
manipulate inside SVG. Unfortunately, not all of these properties can be controlled through your CSS. But nonetheless, you'd want to know that. I guess we're all familiar with the term specificity. Uh, in CSS, which, who wins in determining or uh, coloring out something. Uh, in, uh, in SVG, there's a bit of an awkward order because the, uh, some of the presentation attributes on the elements look seem to be most important, like if you add a style in your uh, HTML on an element, then that typically wins, uh, and that's not the case within SVG. So here we have an, uh, a bit of an example of embedding it. So we have a, uh, a circle here, so, uh, which has a fill color blue. We have an overlaying element where we say fill is green, and we have a style where we say fill is red, and the style wins. Where in traditional thinking, my initial thought would be the fill in the definition would win, and that's not the case, but this is to our, to our advantage. If we... Uh, want to start taking advantage of SVG, we can start reusing elements that are already there. Here you see a circle. That's the one that we had first. That's this one. And then I say, use that same circle again, but position it one on the pixels to the left. So maybe you can get, the, get this feeling that, okay, I can kind of build a Lego kit and compose my images like that. Now we had a definition that's always visible and that's not always uh, desirable. So you can build a library of elements that are by default not visible, but that you can use and then they become visible. So you can have a library for your circle. Uh, so there's a separate section called devs or defined that you can define your circles or whatever element. It's not displayed. Uh, you can have the same thing with a symbol, which is much like a definition. But for a symbol, you can add additional stuff like a view box. But maybe even more importantly, you can have elements for accessibility, like title and stuff like that. So that's uh, so uh, for area stuff, then that makes it uh, more inter interpretable by the browser. So using use, a more practical example. Apologies for using my own stuff. I just didn't have the time to do a separate presentation. So this is part of my company logo. Now you could say the great part, great out parts here uh, are actually mirrored of this part. So now you could say I draw all of it and that's what uh, Chiara, who designed this for us, initially did. And I said, well, that doesn't make much sense because one, it may not be uh, geometrically, uh, geometrically accurate. So, try bear with me uh, also in the back. The, we have here the, the petals of the logo. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, they start with a certain fill and here it draws it. I'll not go into the details how this works, but these things are drawn. Uh, there's actually a fill element on this to combine some of the air, uh, which says, okay, uh, there is a gradient in this. Uh, well, you can't see it with the beamer because it's uh, of awful quality, but we can apply a linear gradient to this with multiple color stops. That's what's done here. Now, when actually wanting to draw this, I just say, okay, I have my middle path because that's not repeated, so I put that here. And then I say, xlink reference my local petals, that's these. This will draw me this. 
Then I say reference it again, or transform it, rotate it 180 degrees around the center, 500, 500. Uh, I'm in the habit of trying to uh, do my graphics work in a 1000 by 1000 grid consistently. It doesn't matter for the resolution, but it matters for my mindset that I don't have to switch to different coordinate systems. So that's why you'll see this 500, 500. So then the result is that you have a full logo, not duplicating this content. So if this petal would were to change, it changes in one place. And it's, you can make sure that it's geometrically correct. Now the problematic part is that by default, if you try to style the use, it fails. That's one of the big drawbacks of uh, SVG. After long tinkering, I found a workaround. I'll come to that. Um, but, and I'll lift the tip of the veil, but you'll invite, you're invited to just look at the code and try and get your head around it later. If we were to have, this is a bit stepping into the future, if we were to have CSS color variables, that would help SVG quite a lot. Because then we could do stuff like define an element, primary color, orange, and then use it in your SVG. And then don't have that drawback of having to go through hoops to uh, use it in use. Unfortunately, that's not the case, and there's some resistance because, well, for CSS itself, I feel it's kind of obsolete with SAS less precompilers, but you can't achieve the same, uh, so for that part I don't need it, but you can't achieve the same effect in inside less files, uh, in SVG files. Now, mind you, this is a wish, things to come. Uh, this is being discussed uh, with Microsoft Edge and uh, W3C. So it's not there, but it's something we wish for. Composing, uh, he will delve into more details. Here you see an overview of the icons that are, in, are to be in the website that I'm to build if I leave this room alive because Ruth will kill me because for not finishing that yet. Uh, this is one style sheet, last file, and this is one SVG file. One SVG file for the, all of these representations of the logos. So, this is part of the HTML of that page. So, we have this inject me, we remember that. Uh, BMK, I think we're... Uh, Brandmark, PIR, I think it's a pyramid. So, oops, Brandmark, pyramid. It references for your SVG, VG icons. But you see, for all the icons down here, it's all referencing the same SVG file, the same optimized file that's small, so you load it once. No need to load other stuff. Then by using some CSS magic, I say, okay, this is my, uh, this is icon type one, uh, this is text, uh, this is a diamond thingy, uh, this is consulting, SEO hosting, trading, whatever, something. And then it renders, uh, this is just the text below it, it renders my SVG file for that icon. Uh, So, if you look at it in more detail for the icon for training, so this is defined. And then we uh, reference this icon one training here. This is this, it's just a cutout. Then translate it, scale it, so it's like this, in this size. Here we, uh, again, translate scale, but because of the classes that are applied, the same use will display be displayed a little bit thicker, green lines, 
but it's still, it's still the same graphical uh, element that's produced in all these four locations. Now this is the tip of the veil. So by experimentation and long weekends, I found out that I can please Internet Explorer and Chrome by addressing the styling in the depth section. And I can please Firefox by addressing the styling in the actual SVG body. And that's what I've done there. So one and two, so you see uh, dot open, you see the stroke, that's monochrome, uh, no filling. Uh, here you see uh, the for the icon types four and three, so that the dot open is actually filled, and the stroke width is 30, so it's a bit wider. I invite you all to look at the source files, and if you have any questions uh, later on, please feel free to contact me. I've put a stack of my business cards out front, so please feel free to get one and contact me. So I can, I'll just leave that. I uh, can show that afterwards, the, the real HTML page, because I think I'll run short of time. Another cool thing that you can do with uh, uh, SVGs is a foreign object. I'm actually going to use that in a project I'm working on. Is where you can say, okay, I've got my rectangle, the green one. And then I say, okay, I have a foreign object. And I can render stuff from other agents, uh, typically the HTML rendering agent being the most uh, obvious one. So I say, I have a foreign object uh, that's uh, positioned, well, in this case, about the same as the rectangle. And then I say, I can just put an HTML code in there. I know it's not very, uh, yeah, didn't know what to put in there. There's so Lauren, uh, Star Trek, Lauren Ipsum, but you catch a drift, hopefully. Well, it wraps. No, that's 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 the reason for the foreign object, because it if it because it's defined within a box, it will flow in that box. Then again, Internet Explorer will be the exception to the rule. Uh, because this will not render in Internet Explorer. So we have a switch and an exception to that. And then this text is entered in Internet Explorer. But if I were to show that, that would be just a long line of text wrapping around and around and around and around. <laughs> so you can work around that with using JavaScript and all kinds of trickery, but yeah, didn't want to show that here. That, that's that's up to you. Uh, I now now I the SVG doesn't know about Z index. That's a wish for later. But by defining the rectangle before defining the text, this gets drawn first. This this gets drawn on top of it. Where I put the rectangle below, then I wouldn't see anything because because it would obscure the text. I could make the rectangle uh, partially opaque. So transparent, and then it still sees stuff, but that's not uh, what's needed. Uh, animation. Um, natively, we have got SMIL. I don't even know what the acronym stands for. Uh, but you can't use it in Internet Explorer, nor in uh, MS Edge. Now, unfortunately, whilst you can use it in Blink, which is the Chrome rendering engine at the moment, they are dropping support for that. And that's all in favor of extending the CSS animations or the standards for CSS animations to do stuff with that. The solution nowadays is to use uh, JavaScript. Uh, the library that we use for uh, animating stuff in JavaScript is called Snap. It's got an Apache 2 license, so it means you can use it. You can find it here. It's perfect to style and animate. 
and also has some fallback images. Now, snip, snap in and by itself is a bit cumbersome. Uh, you'll get the presentation, Frank. Uh, but <laughs> uh, it's a bit cumbersome. Um, it's not as uh, easy as uh, use iconic, where you can say just load all the elements. I'm working on a plugin to allow that. And if time permits, I'll show that. But OK, you can do some cool stuff. So this is like the clock for jab that we had. It's, yeah, it's nice for cool and retro effects. So this is a more of a retro effect. But then again, you have problems with the Internet Explorer. Here you also see an example of uh, where Kiara and I learn of each other. So this was the first incarnation of Kiara's clock. Now I'm a stickler for details. Uh, I can be a real pain in the ass. Uh, so it's, but Kiara can be too, so we can take it from each other. So as Kiara, what, what you drew there, that, I don't know whether you can see it or you even notice it, but these tick lines, they're kind of crooked. They don't point all at the center. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I can't live with that, Kiara. You need to do that differently. So what you typically do then in SVG, you draw one tick line here and one there. And then you, again, use the translation and animation thing and have all of them perfectly centered, geometrically correct, uh, and all are happy, or at least I'm happy. <laughs> and Kiara's happy. Uh, but it, it takes the interaction between the developer and the designer and uh, takes some, uh, it's giving and taking on what you can do and what you should do. You shouldn't waste time on doing these repetitive geometrical things as a designer. It doesn't make sense. That that's, can be done more efficiently in your code. Um, now, if you um, want to have some resources, this is a really nice one, flaticon.com. There's a zillion uh, SVG icons you can use to start with, all free. If you do SVG, you should, uh, and if you start to tinker with it by hand, so it's very easy to write up your SVG in a text editor, but then it doesn't always work. Just, just first thing to do is just run it through the W3C validator so that you know that you've actually got valid syntax. And then you can start optimizing. So there's this really cool tool, SVGO. Uh, it's been around for quite some time, uh, Node.js-based tool for optimizing vector graphics. It's on GitHub. <coughs> You can run it as grunt or as a gulp task. But since a month or two months, there's this really cool UI thing for it. Uh, which I want to share, I hope. No. Which I want to share, or was it? Uh, take arguments. Oh. Hmm. I'll go to the demo part. Uh, so typically you would up, sorry, uh, typically you would up, upload your own SVG, but I'm lazy, so I'll go to the demo part. They have a car in here, and then you can have all kinds of optimizations here on your SVG that will make it totally not readable. So you should always keep your original one if you want to modify it. But even in the def default setting, this little car renders now at five kilobytes uh, with the optimizations put in here. Uh, yeah, it's down here. 
Uh, and one of the important things, for example, is here to precision. If you remember that we, uh, we draw everything. It's like we go from this point to that point. And then we tend to ov be overly precise. Like, okay, let's have 11 digits. That's cool. It'll be really precise. What this tool will allow you is to say, okay, the precision, that's fine. It's now three digits. And now I'm at 41%. If I go to two digits, I'm at 48% savings. I'm got now down to 4.3K. And you have a preview of the car, and you can see, well, if this does not visually affect my SVG, I just as well use my two-digit resolution instead of my three-digit resolution. It saves me bandwidth, better on mobile. So really cool thing and certainly something I'd advise that looking at and trying to wrap your head around all these things. Some of the things you wouldn't want to remove uh, for this, if you're styling it yourself afterwards, for example, clean IDs. It will strip out any IDs which are the way to reference internal parts. And yeah, if you don't have them, then you can't style them. Have a look at that. What does the future bring? Uh, there's been a working uh, draft out for SVG2 now, just recently in April. Uh, that will bring us uh, lots of nice things such as the stroke alignment. Remember that I said that SVG, when it draws, it draws at an infinite, uh, uh, at no width at all. And then when you add a stroke, it will add it to both sides at the same time. So if you have draw along the border of your box, then half of your line will not be visible because it's outside of the line. Now, SVG3 has uh, also drawing modes of inner and outer so that you can say, okay, draw the line actually inside or outside or on top. Lots of other stuff. Most and more importantly is uh, more uh, CSS animatable attributes. Uh, the most important one being the view box, because we saw that we can do a lot of beautiful things with the view box, but you can't address it as a CSS property. You can do that via JavaScript, so it's not impossible. But in an ideal world, I'd like to use SVGs without being dependent on JavaScript. So if we can do that, then you can do all your art direction. You're moving around, you're zooming just by using styles. That would be awesome. Same goes for some positional attributes. And if you look at my previous presentation, you see that uh, some things can be manipulated, but not the, the X and the Y position or the width and height of some elements by CSS. So then you're limited in what you can do with CSS animation. But the trend is that smell is being dropped. There's a pressure on CSS to extend, to get in those uh, elements. CSS. Yes. Yeah, but for example, what, what you don't have in CSS is animating path, path data. Uh, I just don't have enough time, but I can show the demo later. Maybe you've seen them. If you draw a line, you can actually like animate it like by it's like an elastic cord. You pull it out and then leave it and it goes ding 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 ding. Uh, so you can do really subtle animational effects. Uh, uh, you can draw a path in in SVG and animate an object along that path, move it along that path. All very well possible in JavaScript, uh, but I'd rather not use JavaScript if not needed. So animate, animating path data itself, animating shapes, and so transforming them from a circle to a square or from any object to any object. Uh, with just CSS, having synchronization, 
uh, Smil now allows, says, okay, I can start a new animation when a previous one ends. That's not something you can do at this moment with CSS. So we don't want to lose that. That has to go into uh, CSS. Now, on a, I've been bitching on uh, Internet Explorer, but actually there's some relatively good stuff happening on Microsoft Edge in that sense. It's not there yet, but what I've been reading up uh, upon is that in development, they're now listening to the users, and then instead of making the users listen and say, okay, we know it all, just do our bidding and you'll be fine, just follow us. No, they're actually listening. So uh, there are several of these uh, wish list items that have been put forward by the community that have received uh, attention by Edge. Uh, so Outlook is hopeful. That's... At this point, any questions? Because I'm about to wrap up. Frank. Um, was it, um, how is SVG working on mobile phones in connection to um, uh, if you start to animate, yeah. it can be quite uh, detrimental to the, uh, or detrimental, that's maybe a big word, to the processor because it's, uh, there's limited hardware uh, acceleration support for SVGs, so it draws on the CPU when that draws on the power. Just drawing it once, I'd say it's negligible. Okay. Anybody else? Don't be shy. Can you make a variation if you want something to not look perfect? You want to have a little difference. Yes, you can do that with, you could do that with filters, uh, blur it, uh, do stuff like that. Uh, but in and by itself, uh, SVGs are perfect. It's, it's a geometrical description of a shape. So you draw a line and that goes from A to B and that's a straight line. Uh, the thing you can do with that is you say, okay, you can do dash dot dash dot dash or whatever, have a dash pattern in it, but you can't make it jagged. That's something you would need to do by yourself. But you can do apply filters and stuff on that and which make it seemingly look uh, random or do stuff with JavaScript uh, and actually draw a jagged line, which is not that difficult. Yes. Because the, the, if you try it, it's, it's, it's only a few bytes. It's text. It's really fast. Anybody else? George. Yes. Yes. Uh, as with any technology, with uh, great power comes great responsibility. And that's why I'm so pleased to see that we can move away from JavaScript to have these other effects. Because the potential of. Yes, but then you could say, okay, uh, if you can do it another way, I'll just kick you out. If you use that option whilst there is a better one uh, to use. So then, yeah, it is a risk. And uh, yeah, it's something we need to be aware of uh, if we start to supporting it uh, in more detail in Joomla, which I think we should. But we shouldn't say, uh, don't use it because every security measure in place with sufficient intelligence can be gotten around. And once a solution gets out there, then any script kitty will do that. Any more questions? You're free to ask me afterwards, that's fine. If there's no questions, I'll... Oh, yeah, but since uh, it, I'm running out of time, I timed it not entirely perfect, I'll show you afterwards, or so anybody else who wants to. 
So now um, to, to an important part for me, I've got two children and they always need proof that their daddy is doing something that is of interest to other people. <laughs> so I, <laughs> so thank you very much for being in the audience. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>